it's a great pleasure uh, to be back to Hope House. I am a friend of Hope House. And I want to start by thanking uh, James. It's not easy to get up to tell your story. Um, and I want you to know that I am grateful that not only have you gotten the services and treatment that to help you on your path to recovery, that you're paying it forward by being a peer advocate, and that you came to understand that seeking help is a source of strength and not weakness. And to, so, to all the men who are here today for whom see Hope House as a source of support, I want you to know that every day is a new day and asking and seeking help is strength and not weakness. Oh, there. So for the trifocals. <laughs> I also want to thank Paul and our good friend Fred Newton, who's the CEO who's with us in spirit, and he is on vacation. This is our third time of trying to arrange being at Hope House in between what uh, I'm lovingly referring to now as sunflakes rather than snowflakes. Uh, a little reframing, you know? As we all know, opioid addiction is an epidemic. We need to label it. We need to contain it. We need to address it. In Massachusetts, it's impacting individuals, our families, our neighbors, and our friends across the Commonwealth. As poignantly reminded by James, and many here today know, behind every statistic is a very real, real person. And the facts, except I'm not exactly sure where the charts are. <laughs> We're blocking them. That's all right. We up to, thank, thank you, Commissioner. <laughs> so if you look over here, the purple line represents the 2013 motor vehicle fatalities in the Commonwealth. The blue line represents the opioid-related deaths in the Commonwealth. And more people die from an opioid-related overdose than die from a motor vehicle accident by two and a half times. Data released today, and I'll leave the, uh, most of this to the governor, but the data released today from the Department of Public Health, the Bureau of Health Information Statistics, there were 868 confirmed opioid-related deaths in 2013. It's assumed that that number will rise to just under 1,000, to 978 deaths. That's a 46, almost 50% jump from 2012. And in addition to lives lost, our hospitals are experiencing an overwhelming number of people who require hospital stays or a trip to emergency departments, which is the triangle. You all will have to look at it later. Hospitals report that there were more than 2,000 hospital stays and more than 4,500 ER visits from opioid overdoses in 2013. The costs associated with treating opioid addiction are great. However, inaction or not labeling for what it is, which is an epidemic, is actually much greater. I recognize that there are no quick fixes and that we have lots to do. As a first step in tackling this issue, the governor has assembled a small or smallish working group. Attorney General Mark, Mark, Maura Healy and 14 other individuals, a number of whom are here today, that represent diverse backgrounds, different perspectives, and experiences related to prevention, treatment, intervention, and recovery. The governor's statewide opioid working group starts next week to frame the work and to begin a series of very public dialogues about what we can do better and to work towards solutions to stop this crisis. We need lots of tools in this toolkit. Again, I want to thank Fred Newton, who's a good friend, and all of the members of the working group, many of whom are here today, for agreeing to serve in this capacity. We will hold, as I said, four listening sessions and public dialogues across the Commonwealth. The meetings are obviously open, and we hope to ignite conversation and strategies. The first is scheduled for March 10th, 2015 in Worcester, assuming no more snowfalls, from 4 to 6 p.m. And I want to thank Sheriff Evangelitis, who's going to help host that event. A schedule of the sessions will be posted on the Department of Public Health's website shortly. That's www.mass.gov opioids. And for individuals who cannot attend sessions, we will be creating an online ability for comments to the Commonwealth. As the chair of the working group, I have pledged to the governor that these listening sessions will be completed in the next few months. And armed with the information, the group will make tangible recommendations by the end of May. 
You know, we have extraordinary resources in this great commonwealth. You are in one today. We have world-renowned medical professionals, addiction experts who are willing to step up and help. The working group will collaborate with all these experts and many others across the state to review the problem and the ways in which we leverage our resources to reduce the rate of addiction. So it's now my great privilege to introduce my boss, the governor of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. Before I do, I just, a couple of things, since his staff did not give me his official bio. Um, one. We've known each other for a long time, you shouldn't need it. I don't, I don't, I don't. So I'm gonna speak from the heart. Many people think of the governor as a man who, with extraordinary management skills, and he has those. So he has a really good head for numbers. What I'm gonna tell you about the governor of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts is he cares deeply about people. He has a huge heart. And for him, it is always about people, which was why it was a privilege for me to come back to the Commonwealth to be his secretary. So with that, let me introduce the governor of the Commonwealth of this of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, Governor Charlie Baker. Somebody write that down. <laughs> so I want to share that one with my mom and dad. Um, my dad would like it, my mom would believe it. Um, thank you very much, Mary Lou, and uh, I can't think of a better person to serve as Secretary of Health and Human Services or to chair this sort of a working group. And as I look out, I see several members of the working group here with us this morning, this afternoon. I want to thank you all for being here, and I want to thank Chief Justice for being here, and Judge Moynihan, I want to thank you for being here as well. And I want to thank our elected officials and our new commissioner of DPH, uh, Monica, for being here as well. And I want to thank all of you for coming out. Um, you know, this is one of those issues that, um, one of the things I've said about serving as governor and basically public sector and public life generally is don't be surprised when you're surprised. Um, you don't always know what the next thing is that's going to be part of your agenda. And I certainly didn't expect to spend the first 45 days of my administration shoveling snow. Um, <laughs> but that's kind of how the game gets played. And over the course of uh, the campaign last year, I was struck by how many times I would enter a diner, be in somebody's backyard, invited, um, be in somebody's house, <laughs> you know, sort of campaign, okay, around the Commonwealth. And uh, and I would always say kind of the same things to people. So tell me what's working and what's not. And I was, after a while, I was just really surprised by how many people would tell me stories that related to opiate addiction. Um, and it didn't matter what part of Massachusetts I was in. It didn't matter uh, what kind of neighborhood I was in. It didn't really, none of, it didn't matter what the age of the people I was talking to were. It was one of those things that just came up over and over and over again. Uh, before we started seeing all the stories in the press about it. And, um, and it was one of those things that I said, you know, this is more than just anecdote. There's, there's something deeper going on here. And, uh, and of course, there were ultimately a whole series of reports and stories about what was going on with this. And I made it something that Karen Polito and I talked about a lot over the course of the last few months of the campaign. And, we talked about it again in the inauguration, and we've actually scheduled this event four times. Yeah. Um, so we're really glad that any of you came because um, we clearly had trouble making it happen. And, uh, and the idea behind putting a working group together was twofold. Number one, um, to really give some people who have experience with this an opportunity to engage with one another and more importantly to engage with the public. Um, and to hear the stories, observations, and thoughts about both the nature of the problem and what we can do to deal with it going forward. And I can't be more proud and pleased of the group that agreed to sign up and to play on this. And it's a pretty broad cross-section of folks. Uh, and I'm really looking forward um, to the work product that they will produce as they go forward here. And uh, James, I want to thank you very much for, um, for your thoughts. And one of the things I would say is that um, well, I think money certainly always factors into a lot of this stuff. The one thing I heard downstairs when we were meeting with some of the folks who are here, um, what I heard from them was how important shared experience was. Um, 
how important it was to be able to talk to somebody um, and engage with somebody who can actually get what you're saying. And, um, and, and I think in some ways that's one of the things, it doesn't have to be about addiction, it can be about a lot of different things. If you can find a way to create connection, you can cr find a way to create hope. And I think for many people, it's the connection as much as anything else that creates possibility. And, um, and I hope one of the things that comes out of all this is a lot more capacity to connect. Um, and I thank you again for your comments this morning and your willingness to speak on behalf of uh, Hope House and, uh, and this community. Um, with respect to uh, this initiative, the Secretary already mentioned one of the things we're going to do is we're going to start making a lot of the data we collect publicly available. Um, there's a lot of information the Department of Public Health collects on a lot of things. And uh, a lot of it would actually be pretty interesting if it ever found its way into the public domain. And um, one of the things Monica and Mary Lou and I have talked about is being a lot more aggressive about taking the data that DPH has that can inform a lot of public conversations and public discussions and making it more available to the public. And we're going to start producing data around um, overdoses on a quarterly basis and eventually, hopefully, on a monthly basis. It'll be county by county at first, and ultimately the goal is to literally be able to do it community by community which will help people develop a much better understanding about what's really going on community by community around our commonwealth so that we can start making better decisions with respect to how we allocate resources, time, energy, effort, and all the rest. Um, two, 2013 data is being released today. 2014 data will be available in April. Um, the second thing I want to bring up is uh, there are a lot of extra medications lying around in people's um, medicine chests, um, cabinets in their kitchens, cabinets in their bathrooms. Um, and I want to encourage citizens to use the drop boxes that are available uh, at, lo at local police stations that are maintained by the police uh, and the sheriff departments. It's a great way to get rid of stuff that you really shouldn't and don't want to have lying around. And I want to uh, thank both Sheriff Tompkins and Sheriff McDonald for your help with respect to this and your partnership with regard to this program. Um, I also want to point out Andrew Dreyfus is here from Blue Cross Blue Shield. Uh, the folks at Blue Cross went through a long process of discussing the issue of um, opiate prescribing with um, themselves, with their members, with their provider community, and they came up with a whole series of initiatives to deal with prescription pain management and medication safety program. Um, they've been doing it since 2012. Uh, they have a big advisory group that works with them to make sure that what they're doing is clinically appropriate and effective um, and balances the needs of those with chronic pain uh, with responsible and careful use of prescription medication. And they've actually seen about a 25 percent decrease in opioid prescription claims, in particular with Vicodin and Percocet, over the first two years of the program. And uh, we are certainly anxious to pursue some of the strategies and techniques that they've used with the group insurance Commission, which deals with state employees and retirees and their families, and the Mass Health Program as well. And we think these kinds of best practices and ideas developed in conjunction with the provider community, the patient community, and others can be a very nice way of building a strategy around prevention on the front end. And there are also a lot of things we think we can do working with our colleagues on the addiction side to deal with this on the back end. Because as Secretary Sutter said, this has to be about prevention, intervention, and um, and treatment and all of those issues are going to be part of the conversation that's going to be led by the working group and I'm anxious to move forward on this. I'm glad we finally got around to having at least one day where it wasn't snowing so that we could schedule this so that we can do the kind of work that needs to be done to make this problem something less of an epidemic here in the Commonwealth and give people back that connection and hope that they need to build a life and a future. Thank you.